Larry McLean's journey to New York to battle a towering six foot eight Irish bare knuckle champion, presented by the mob as their finest, is a tale from his book, The Governor, that stirs much debate. Why? Because Lenny's life is such a fantastic tale that he's still being debated to this day by fans and detractors alike. Critics argue his book is a work of fiction, omitting defeats to professional fighters from his memoirs. These points, while valid, don't conclusively prove that Lenny's New York adventure is a fabrication. His fans will argue that his immense fighting ability is there for everyone to see on footage of him beating the legendary Roy Shaw twice and his numerous other fights. Underworld figures who knew Lenny also say he was one of the toughest and best street fighters London has ever seen. The fight, as per Lenny's timeline, likely occurred in the mid-80s, a time when five families held New York's reigns. The Gambinos, the Genovese, the Bananos, the Colombos and the Lucchese's. An aged ex-mob boss is said to have orchestrated this organised fight to pit New York's toughest versus London's hardest fighter. Could this enigmatic elder have been a smokescreen for Wilf Pine, the respected underworld figure in England. Wilf Pine would not have been an old man at that point, would have been late thirties at most, but was the point man for the mob in the UK. There was a whole documentary to be done on Wilf's amazing story. He was a revered figure in gangland London and in New York, with close ties to the Genovese family for his friendship with Joey Pagano, a senior mob figure. As Lenny narrates his arrival at JFK, whisked away in a limousine, given the five-star treatment, the details paint a vivid portrait of 80s New York, from the vibrant leotards in Central Park to the business-like demeanour of his host stripping Rolexes. It's a depiction so rich in detail, it asks the question, is it a recollection or a reimagining of the writer? The alleged opponent, a colossal Irish man of colour named John McCormick, remains a mystery. His existence hinted at only by sparse references that might well be from the Governor book itself. I'll now read Lenny's recount of the brutal fight, after which I'll share my views on the account. But what do you think? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I'm always interested to hear what you will think, especially those who knew Lenny and his friends at that time. He was a big bastard, six foot eight, 24 stone, give or take a pound. He was stamping up and down and punching one clenched fist into the open palm of the other, over and over again. Our mates with his suits are there, and they had some hired help to do the running about. The suits know what they are, so they were quiet, polite, and behaved like gentlemen. But the help, because they're F all, were dressed up like spivs and gangsters, and looked like extras from the Godfather. There was one light bulb above our heads, and most of the help were wearing sunglasses. The one doing the Cagney impersonation checked me over to see if I was clean. It was like being in the neck, I thought. Any minute now, he's going to feel around my nuts and I'll down him, gun or no gun. I could see he was carrying from the bulge in his jacket. He didn't know, and the fight was on. I took my head down, flew at McCormack, and drove him back against a concrete pillar with a fl flurry of tight punches. As he backed up, I swung one to his forehead, cracking his head against the post. If he hadn't grabbed hold of me, I think he would have gone down, because for a second his eyes rolled up. I was being crushed by his massive arms, and I couldn't move. Down came his head to knock me senseless, but I got mine in first and did his nose. He let go of me, and I got four rib breakers into him, then jumped back and kicked him as hard as I could in the balls. He was wearing a cod piece, so it didn't have the effect it should. Rattled him, though. The atmosphere was like a fight I had at a fairground over in Leighton Stone. Dead quiet. It was all too serious for a bit of cheering. We broke apart and weighed each other up. With a big lump on his forehead and suffering a good bit of pain from his ribs and nuts, he looked beaten. But he's not. Whoop! Look out! He came at me like an effing bull. I sidestepped, clenched both fists together and smashed him in the kidneys. My belt and his own momentum carried him into the hired help. And I was right behind him, knocking them all over the place. He fell onto his hands and as he got up, I kicked him full in the face. Rolled him over and kicked him again. I, won't give, I wouldn't give him a second. I want to destroy that face. He's trying to fight back, but it's all reflex. I don't think he can ever see me. Six punches to the jaw, cheek and forehead finished him. Blood was pouring from his nose and torn lips and dripping onto the stone floor and making a little pool beside his head. Hard luck, son, but you would have done the same to me. That's the name of the game. Funny, really. I've just smashed the family's best and you'd think there would be a bit of fuss, but there's no reaction at all. The suits handed over a briefcase with the money 
wished us all the best and were gone. They never even looked at their man lying flat on the deck, bleeding, and still sparked out. 20 minutes later, me and my pals are back in the hotel. My hands have come up like balloons. Both busted again, I said. I think we'd better get out of here. The bosses seem good stuff, but some of their boys were looking a bit cross-eyed. They might just take it into their heads to get the money back. We slipped out, grabbed a taxi, and took off for Kennedy Airport. So that was Lenny's account of his epic battle with the Man Mountain McCormack. But what do I think the truth is behind this story? Previously, I did a video on a fight Lenny had in Glasgow, which his detractors swore blind was a lie and a fabrication. I've now had the fight verified and have been given the name of the man he actually fought. I shall put that and pin that um, in the comments of that video. I've also got another story of Lenny searching for a very well-respected and dangerous gangster in Glasgow on the orders of Arthur Thompson Sr. that he was paid to bash up or worse. Now, this isn't featured in any books out there, and I'm waiting for, for permission from the person involved to talk about it, um, but points to the willingness of Lenny to travel to carry out heavy work. On the spin side, I've studied Kelly McLean's book, which is a really, really good read about the insight of Lenny, and a book written about Wilf Pine, but find no reference to that particular fight. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Wilf in particular is very old school, and in the book, he doesn't give much detail on a lot between himself and some of the London lot, which I also know to be true. In fact, a friend of mine was writing a documentary or was going to do a documentary, may still do so on Wilf. He's got some crazy stories about him as well. Really interesting character. What I will say, though, is that Lenny did go into work in film in the States. It's clear he had ties there, so I don't see why it's not possible that this fight took place. Many UK fighters have travelled over since on the underground scene to challenge US fighters and vice versa. So on the whole, I would say I think it's a true account. It's very likely exaggerated. Detractors will point out that Lenny does seem to fight a lot of six foot eight fighters. But that aside, it's confirmed within the underworld. And I've been told this personally by respected figures. He did take part in many bare knuckle fights, which they'd seen themselves. One person I spoke to is a well-respected London face from the 80s onwards said, I know Ron Stander came over and fought Roy Shaw and he had mob guys with him. We helped Roy out with his training but were involved with Lenny. But it wouldn't have surprised me if he did go across the pond. He was a dangerous man, bare knuckle. Boxing didn't suit him. Len was good friends with Mickey O'Rourke, the actor. He went on to say, the mob guys who came over with Ron Sander had their rooms robbed by some of the chaps and said they'd never come back over. I was too rough over here. Now that was a friend of mine who was a well-respected face in London telling me about the Ron Stander situation where the... Um, um, some of the chaps had robbed the rooms of the mob guys that came over with him. He, Ron Stander was like the the first great white, well, not the first maybe, but one of the great white hopes of Americans heavyweight boxing and Roy Shaw fought him. So there was these, you know, ties from England to America. Um, in fact, there's a photo which I'll put in now of the craze with Sonny Liston. You know, there was lots of ties going back and forth, especially in the fight game. So if the likes of Decker Heggy can go over and fight in America, or Americans can come over and fight the Geordie bare knuckle fighter, I forget his name now, and there's been plenty back and forth, I don't see why Lenny wouldn't have done that in the past. You know, as my friend said, he certainly had the bottle to do it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments.